Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to start off by, uh, by thanking um, our expert panelists for agreeing to share their perspectives today on uh, product innovation and distribution. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, to my immediate left, we have Keen Driscoll, the uh, CEO of Validus Reinsurance Limited, Tom Holtz, the CEO of Aerial Re, Kathleen Reardon, the CEO of Hamilton Re, and uh, Charles Cooper, the President and Chief Underwriting Officer of XL Re Limited. Welcome and thank you for uh, agreeing to attend today. Uh, my name is Matthew Britton. I'm a Partner and Managing Director with PwC here in Bermuda. Uh, I concentrate on serving our clients in the insurance and reinsurance industry from both an assurance and advisory perspective. Um, in terms of the panel, we'll, uh, we'll look to open up the, the panel to questions uh, probably after around 40 minutes. Um, uh, if there are any questions in the meantime, please put up your hand and I'll, uh, if I notice, I'll take that break. Um, but to start off with, I'd like to start off with the, to the panel in terms of the, 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 the premise of the description of this panel around product innovation. Um, currently, reinsurers are facing sort of very difficult market conditions while investors are benefiting from a variety of reinsurance vehicles in which they can deploy capital. Um, but I'd be interested in the panel's perspective on whether those factors have been a distraction or an impetus on reinsurers' focus on product innovation and how they see themselves differentiating themselves in the market. Maybe, Keen, I could start with you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I, I would argue, broadly speaking, where we've seen innovation hasn't necessarily been on the product side. Um, there's certainly been tremendous innovation with respect to vehicles um, to facilitate capital inflows into our market space or to capture the risk profile of, uh, of particularly Nat Cat. But the traditional market, um, I think over the last century, century and a half, um, has developed a product suite uh, that is incredibly flexible um, it, it may have been largely homogenized in terms of how it's sold, but true innovation, true product innovation, uh, we haven't really witnessed. We see changes in reinstatement provisions. We see expansions in hours clauses. Um, territorial expansions going from regional placements to worldwide placements. I wouldn't define that as, as innovative. I, I would just say that's the natural course of market cyclicality. Uh, but the innovations really come through capital. Capital influence. Tom? Yeah, I think I think Keen's point is, is broadly broadly right, and I'd agree with it. I think that innovation tends to occur at moments of extreme, you know, tends to occur most when, when entities are under pressure or when markets are under pressure. I think when times are sort of good or medium, uh, people don't innovate as much. So I expect that, you know, innovation pressure in the market is going to continue to increase. Maybe, maybe, Kathleen, I could ask you for the, the, the latter end of the question in terms of uh, have these market forces plus the sort of alternate capital flow into the market cause reinsurers to think about how they're differentiating themselves at this point in time? Obviously, we've got a, a large supply of capital with not necessarily an increasing demand base. Is it important to differentiate yourself as reinsurers in this particular market at this time? Um, absolutely. That's a very important piece of the, of the puzzle. Um, and I think we, we are differentiating ourselves. There's plenty of capital, as you said, but is it all relevant capital? Um, and with, as far as innovation, I think the sidecars and the cat bonds and the ILS industry is innovation that benefits clients. Ultimately, the cost saving gets passed on to the clients. So it might look like we're looking after the needs of our capital providers, but in reality, the whole, the whole point, uh, one of the main drivers was to pass on the savings to the clients. Um, so it, it might be packaged in a different way, and now I think we need to innovate again. So that, that worked well, um, but we need to innovate again. I think we're on the cusp of change, and uh, you know, what, is the next, what is the next innovation is the question. Okay. So. All right, so I, I would broadly agree with what people are saying. I guess in some ways it's not necessarily innovation, but evolution of the product, and in my view it is... Um, <clears throat> somewhat of a supply-driven phenomenon where there's a lot of capital that wants to figure out a way to get into the market. And so there's been a lot of innovation in providing vehicles that allow investors to, to access um, cat risk, primarily. Um, and, and initially, a lot of that innovation was around vehicles and structures, single-shot collateralized 
reinsurance that investors can provide capital, uh, and, and there's, some, there's some finite horizon as to how long that capital is committed. Uh, and there's a manifestation uh, trigger there, so it's clear if that capital is impaired or not at the end of the, of the, um, of the term. I think what's, what's happening, though, is the knock-on effect of that is, is creating uh, additional evolution by traditional reinsurers and alternative capital providers because um, I think everyone at this stage in the market is looking for a way to differentiate themselves. Uh, and product innovation is, is a clear way to do that. Um, I don't think it's been especially fast. And I think in, in large part it has been um, a reaction to all this additional capacity coming into the market and for trying to figure out a way to, uh, to get utilized. Can, can I just take a crack at that again, Matt? I, I think um, if you look at the evolution uh, or just what's happened in the last, say, 10 years in our market, right? we've had big inflows of capital. Um, we've seen some, uh, we'll call it new, I wouldn't call it innovative, but it, it, new products developed to suit the needs of single-shot collateralized capacity. And we've seen, um, we've seen our client appetite broadly evolve from there's a new new product with a, with a clearly differentiated cost of capital. We want to capitalize on that. The traditional market with a product that's effectively an evergreen promise to pay that's been litigated and adjudicated over a century um, is incredibly flexible both from a coverage grant but, but also a temporal basis. And now we're actually seeing clients go from uh, this is a new interesting product. I want to I want to um, avail myself of a cheaper cost of capital. To actually, um, when I line up, and this is really I think the, the part of the point that Charles was making, when you line up the challenges of capital release and forced commutations and limited life cycle um, products in an ILS box versus a traditional rated product, um, there are true value propositions that clients are. I think the innovation we're going to see is a combination of a lower cost of capital with a traditional reinsurance product. And we're actually starting to see that now where a lot of the money is actually sitting behind reinsurers, whether it's a dedicated ILS provider inside of a reinsurance space or a lot of quota share capacity that sits behind reinsurers where uh, customers are saying, I actually think I can still avail myself of a lower cost of capital, but get all the benefits of a very broad reinsurance product that I understand. I understand how trade I understand that people have relationships with. Fantastic, thanks. Maybe now I could turn to sort of the, the needs and expectation of the sort of the reinsurance buyers. Um, we've seen over the sort of recent years a number of insurance companies sort of increasing their retentions. Uh, we've seen some reduction in the size of reinsurance panels. We've even seen some insurance companies go uh, directly to the capital markets themselves in terms of cap bonds, etc. In your mind, as a panelist, are these examples that the, the sort of the longer-term needs and expectations of buyers are changing? And in your views, what are the most sort of important changes from a buyer perspective that reinsurers will need to focus upon and adapt to? Maybe due to the last one, I'll, I'll move it down the pipe to Tom. Sure, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, I, I think that it's abs. Well, first of all. I won't say it's an ill-informed question, but uh, <laughs> you just did, <laughs> which it well um, could be. We, uh, I think that <clears throat> it's arguable that clients are, are buying less. I think actually there may be pockets of the market where retention is going up, but I think broadly the loss in supply and demand still work in the market, and pricing is is going down on a risk-adjusted basis. So I think actually from the analysis we've broadly done, I think you know buying in total is is up a bit. Um, certainly, we saw that in Florida, uh, limits purchased increased in our analysis by seven to ten percent um, this past year. So I think there is still you know, plenty of, of limit being purchased, although it's in different forms, not necessarily from the traditional traditional reinsurance market. I guess in, in terms of you know what you need to do to stay relevant, it's a market with increasing choice for seeding companies, and I think the reduction in panel size is just a, a reflection of that increase increased choice. And I think an increased demand for, you know, we can define relevance maybe as, you know, scale, rating, and I think the ability to be a constructive partner in the risk sort of analysis and decision. I think if you're a pure following market, 
I think you're in trouble. If you don't have solid pricing tools, the ability to engage with your customers, to work out differentiated product types, and you know a lot of permutations to an existing product, I think you're at, at strong risk of being just sort of disintermediated in the process and falling off these panels. I, I think clients still value relationship, service, um, basically the, the value that you're adding. And it's not necessarily a size that matters. It's more quantity. It's quality over quantity. Um, and you're, you're, you're definitely seeing some consolidation of panels, but this is nothing, this is really nothing new. Clients have always valued a broad support of multiple classes of business. Um, they valued uh, the time spent understanding their risks, helping them analyze some of the more difficult exposures. Um, I, I think this has always happened. Maybe it's just more, it's more prominent right now. Yeah, and I would say that um, both of those observations are a little bit sound bites, and I think you get uh, the, the large commercial buyers, certainly there have been instances, and it gets widely reported in the press, of people dropping programs or buying less reinsurance. And, and a lot of those same large commercial buyers are global, and, and I think they think about the way they buy a lot differently than a lot of our clients. Um, they think about it much more holistically. They're looking for a breadth of um, product offerings across many different geographies. And, and I think a lot of them are thinking about consolidating their panels, and they want to have a more holistic relationship with their reinsurance counterparties, and they want to have a conversation not around their CAT, U.S. CAT renewal, but around the overall relationship and the reinsurance panel. And, and so I think you're, you need to differentiate between the large commercial guys, and those are the ones that get reported in the press and you hear sound bites versus you know, most of our client base, which you know, there, there's a, a trade-off between a concentrated and a diversified panel from a from a reinsurance counterparty security standpoint. If I could jump in for, before Keen, that's a, it's a good point. Uh, the clients are more educated now, so if you think back to when the Bermuda cat market started, we were the ones showing them the analytics and their exposures and their concentrations, but now the clients and, and with some help of the brokers, they're doing that on their own. So we sort of need to get to the next stage of maturity of what we can offer the clients. Sure. Uh, if, from our perspective, we see an incredibly clear trend <clears throat> of, of buyers um, today um, uh, looking to narrow panels. I, I wouldn't call that necessarily um, a structural change in the market. I mean, I guess from our perspective, you, know, you look at the market and primarily customers are interested in price and then capacity. City, and then you know, softening market where you can have a high degree of confidence with respect to, I know I can clear my program and I know I can clear my program at the price that is acceptable. I'm going to move on to what's important down the list. Those things are, um, I'm going to minimize the administrative burden on, on my placement. Part of that is panel consolidation. I mean, it, on bigger placements, there are 70 to 80 markets on some of these. So to take that from 70 to 80 down to 40, uh, that's an important step. It makes a buyer's life easier. It makes the broker's life easier. It improves margins um, for those that are involved. Overlay that with the fact that if you just take the cat market or the property market, the top 30 global customer groups drive 80% of top line and 80% of bottom line. So these happen to be the same customers that are um, have heavily invested in um, ERM involvement. They're utilizing capital models. The natural output from capital models is to keep more frequency and seed out more volatility, very simplistically speaking. That results in retention increases, particularly as we've had strengthening in, in um, you know, the broader financial markets. And, and overall results have been quite strong. So I, I think what we're observing is, is uh, just sort of the natural evolution of, of, of things changing, there hasn't been uh, a, a meaningful increase in, in demand, although I agree with, with Tom that we have seen some uptick. It's not like a shrinking, but uh, it hasn't kept pace with supply. So it sort of puts us in this position where um, it's just the natural out, outcome of the supply-demand imbalance. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, maybe then we can move on to sort of uh, opportunities. When we... Um, Often when we think about opportunities for reinsurers, you can sort of categorize them into some sort of major buckets, sort of emerging or 21st century risks, 
emerging economies, uh, partnering with governments who, who ensure a sort of a, a significant amount of windstorm, uh, flood and terrorism, and finally underinsured risks such as sort of the California earthquake. Where, is, where do you see the, sort of the most viable opportunities are for an uptick on the demand side, um, considering the size sort of likelihood and potential timing of each of those sort of potential areas of opportunity, and don't be limited to those areas? Um, I, I would say our, our, our biggest chance here is probably to, to harness technology. And it's, it, we're living in a digital world, and there, we have social media all over the place. We need to, I mean, that's an easy place to start and, and say, let's cut some cost. I mean, the whole distribution channel is loaded with extra, extra cost that we can certainly streamline. So if we embrace technology on the, on the, on the, on the uh, administrative side, we can, we can um, reduce expenses. And then if we embrace it on the pricing side, uh, there's, there's, we'll get to those answers on these emerging risks quicker. So cyber uh, for, as a good example. Uh, so I think technology is a good place to start. Um, and obviously on the, uh, the more reducing government involvement, we're, we're, we're doing that already. We're uh, folks like um, uh, Validus are, are in front of the Congress, uh, US Congress talking, uh, to, uh, convincing TRIA to, to be, um, to reduce, uh, to, to um, uh, basically allow reinsurers to come in and accept this risk. We're comfortable accepting terrorism, risks like terrorism and flood. So basically we just need to keep doing that and convincing the governments that, we're, that we have the wherewithal, uh, that, we, that they, tr they can trust us enough that we'll do, that we'll as assume the risk and we'll do the right thing for their, for their, um, their country people. Yeah, I would say, um, <clears throat> You know, I definitely agree with that. I think that under insurance is a, is a huge opportunity for, for all of us. And, and the gap between economic and insured loss is actually widening. If you look at the last 30 years, it's getting bigger and bigger. So, I mean, that's, a, that's just a huge opportunity. And, and, you know, the emerging markets is part of the answer to that. And it, but it's not just the emerging markets. There's, there's a huge gap there and a huge opportunity for insurance penetration rates to, to grow. But even in the developed markets, I mean, you look at California and the take-up rate for California earthquake for homeowners is 10%. So when the big one hits California, which it will, 90% of that homeowner's loss is going to be non-insured and 10% insured. Uh, Japan, another example, um, from 2011, uh, the insured loss was, I think it's about 25, 30 billion. Uh, economic loss north of 100 billion. So it's not just the emerging market, but the developing markets. And there's there's a real opportunity for, for all of us to, um, to educate. And I think insurance companies in general have done a very poor job of educating consumers as to the value of the product. Um, and it's insurers, but also, uh, you know, it's often quite, um, quite often, particularly in the California case, it's, it's um, the government gets involved. And, and they get involved in setting the rates and also in, in setting um, uh, which, which coverages are compulsory and which are not. And that has a big, obviously, impact on, on, on take-up rates. Thanks. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I, I think the opportunities, um, and, and we'll take them from sort of what the near-term actionable opportunities from, from our perspective. Uh, clearly, terrorism, um, you know, we've been fairly vocal in our view that the private market should have a more substantial role in the public-private partnership. Terrorism is a truly unique peril, particularly related to um, chemical, biological, radiological events. We think there should be a, a clearly defined and very prominent role from a governmental perspective. But for conventional events, uh, we're utterly convinced that the industry has both the balance sheet and capability of understanding and aggregating and managing that risk. So um, I feel like we're um, an outlier in that view, but um, my expectation is over time you'll start to see more involvement from the private market stuff. Um, beyond that, I would look at flood. I, I, we view the NFIP is, is fundamentally flawed. Um, everything that's wrong with uh, a government subsidized program is you have uh, tremendous pricing anomalies that aren't evenly distributed across, uh, across um, society, but that's a phenomenal opportunity for someone who can access the data and has the risk willingness to uh, effectively depopulate or cherry pick the best risks in the NFIP. 
that will be an area that we look in the next 12 to 36 months. I think you'll actually see a fair amount of action in that space. We, we're aware of a, a number of initiatives in place there. Um, beyond that, California really is, I think, the golden goose. If we could figure out a way to get um, the GSEs to mandate um, earthquake insurance the same way you see it with, with wind and flood and, and exposed areas, that would truly turn uh, the tables with respect to capital allocation globally, uh, forget the US. So um, that is an area that we're quite interested in. Um, the folks at ABR and RAA have, have, I think, done some, some excellent work recently just starting to educate um, the parties that be within government that, uh, that there is an appetite and a willingness um, and a substantial global capital base to support that type of risk, and we're very supportive of that. And then I think you know other areas like cyber, it's an emerging risk. I think people are just, just at the tip of the spear understanding exactly uh, the, the quantum of, of the risk associated with that. And there, there will be primarily primary product uh, innovation in the reinsurance market. It's going to need to, uh, to find a way to support that. Um, and so we'll, there's a lot of discussion on that right now. So I think those areas alone are enough to substantially increase the pot. Tom, any final comments? Yeah, maybe just, I guess, in the, in the range of governmental sort of programs, I think there's sort of the actionable, stuff that's fairly actionable, and then there's stuff that's going to be very, very sticky and difficult to, difficult to dislodge from the embedded subsidies that exist there. Um, I think that, you know, broadly stimulating customer demand is sort of outside our, our, to some degree, outside our control or ability. Very difficult to do. Primary industries, and I think, agree a poor job of it, but I don't think... Not sure how much better a job they could do to actually make people change when the risk events are very infrequent and sort of hard to hard to put a probability around for people. So I think it gets it gets challenging. I guess when I think about some of the more interesting emerging opportunities, I think for us, you know, given some of the the changes in ownership, uh, emerging markets, um, you know, with the right partner, becomes a pretty interesting thing to start exploring. But again, I think it's with the right partner. I think you know, entering an emerging market um, without a good understanding of what's happening in that market, how the culture works, is, is an extremely difficult uh, thing to do. Thanks. You know, um, <clears throat> part of the reason with the, the, the low take-up rates is that people know the government will come in and save the day at the end. Um, they'll, they'll get a grant from the US federal government, for example. So. The, you know, so part of it's education, especially in the emerging markets, but uh, a large part of it is that comfort that the government's not going to leave them high and dry. And perhaps that's, a, that, that's part of the education that the reinsurance and insurance industry need to give to the government, uh, that they need, that's not the role of government, that the, there's, there's a private market that can handle these exposures. Uh, and they don't need to keep increasing, <clears throat> adding to their deficit. Uh, so that's part of it. Well, to, to that end, to Tom's point, I think that should be our role. I think from a from the perspective of the unified voice uh, within the reinsurance industry, using um, you know, important um, trade bodies within, not trade bodies, but um, uh, um, trade associations or, or, or lobbying firms in the, uh, the DC environment goes an incredibly long way, right? So our voices can and, and should be heard with respect to that. And I found that there's a very eager audience to hear that there are private market solutions. I mean, particularly with the turnover and control of, of the house, um, you know, we're, we're actually quite bullish about the, uh, uh, the intermediate term prospects for, um, for, for more demand and more stimulus, more private market involvement. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. I think here and the RAA and others are doing, are doing great work, as are some individual companies in, in pushing those agendas forward. I guess my point was simply that I think there's some, some opportunities that are pretty tractable and, and ripe, and there's some that are going to be pretty intractable that are going to be you know, very hard for us, I think, structurally to, you know, to move forward. So it's more about what's the continuum of these opportunities and how do we sort of parse, parse that opportunity set and focus resources on moving the ones we think can get moved, which okay. I think NFIP is, you know, is a, the most obvious to me of one that I completely concur with you is, is completely um, it is a poster child right, for inefficient subsidization by the government. Yeah, and I think that, that the alternative capital that's flowing in the market um, really does 
present all of us with an opportunity to to leverage that. And and you know the one so we can moan about reinsurance rates going down, or we can figure out ways to use part of that to stimulate additional demand. Um, you know, certainly you're seeing you know some opportunities like the state of Florida that's transferring more risk off of their own balance sheet and into reinsurers and, and alternative capital providers' balance sheets, and and that's good and that's healthy. Um, and I think that that will continue. And I think that the cyber insurance example, I mean, some of the magnitude of of, uh, of some of these losses and the loss potential are too great for, for single insurers or reinsurers' balance sheets to take on. So leveraging that third-party capital to, 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 to build solutions that are meaningful to the buyers, I think, is really important. So, Charles, maybe I could um, sort of Talking about sort of cyber as an emerging risk that's out there, obviously there's a there's a few well discussed emerging risks that are that are potentially insurable, including cyber, um, supply chain management, global climate change, etc. But stepping back a little bit, um, uh, how how significantly has the risk environment for insureds actually changed over sort of recent years and, and sort of uh, the past decades? How has that actual risk environment for them changed? Well, I mean, one of the things that, that we often cite is if you look back at the, um, at the S&P 500 and the value of the S&P 500, 30 years ago, 70% of the value of the S&P 500 was tangible assets, um, and 30% was intangible assets. If you look at that today, that is the complete inverse. Um, so 30% is tangible, 70% of the value of the S&P 500 is from intangible assets. So we, as, a, as, a, as an insurance industry, we do a pretty good job with tangible assets. We understand physical assets. We can look at years and years of actuarial data and come up with prices. Um, intangible assets is a much, much more difficult thing. And if you think about from the perspective of a CFO, somebody who's buying insurance and looking to protect their own balance sheet, and what they're worried about, and you're the size of an Exxon or a, you know, a massive company, they really do understand a lot of those physical assets. Um, and they're not really worried about those, those intangible assets that um, really create a huge opportunity for us. And, and you know, cyber was, you know, at Monte Carlo, people asked me, how was Monte Carlo? I said, it was all about cyber. Everybody was talking about cyber. And I think that's just the most cited example. It's, it's clearly, um, clearly a huge opportunity for everyone, but it has to be a meaningful solution. It can't be, uh, you know, a $10 million sublimit on, on, a, on a, you know, property all risk policy. Is um, so following on from that question, if there is if there is that dramatic change in sort of the risk profile of companies over the last sort of two three decades, uh, you, I think you're intimating that the the underlying products haven't actually necessarily changed that much. Um, obviously, some of these cyber risks that are how do you put it? They're only just crystallizing into some real examples of what an actual insured loss could be. Um, are you expecting the sort of the products to come out on the more intangible side in the near future, or do you see that it's going to have to take some large insurable losses to emerge for the industry to digest what you're actually going to be providing coverage for? Well, I, I mean, I would say some risks are, are just not insurable, and NBCR might be a, a good example that Keen brought up. Um, and I'm not saying cyber is, is not insurable, but it's it has a lot of complication. Um, one of them is, is gov there's government threats. So is China looking into a, a U.S. company? Um, is the Chinese government doing uh, breaching security systems? That, that to me, is, is, a, is something that governments should, should handle. That, that doesn't off, you know, I can't think of an easy way to ensure something that is a government fighting uh, another government. Um, but I think the insurance and reinsurance industry has been here before, right? If you, if you Think back um, to when the ACEs and Excels uh, started. They started for a reason. That there was a capacity crunch, and then we, um, so we saw we had a, we had a problem and we solved it. There, there's not a lot of data at the at the extreme points on the on the curve for those things either. We we just we extrapolated. We got comfortable with clients. We found other ways to get comfortable with the exposure. Um, and the same thing with the with the, the cat product. Uh, there, we haven't had that $80 billion event, although we're pricing for it. So I think we can get there. Um, it takes a little bit of trust and, and faith and you know, maybe some, do some relative uh, comparisons with other lines of business. But the industry's done it before. Business interruption is another e example. That was sort of, oh, we, we can't cover that. And now it's, just, it's broadly offered. So 
I, th I think we'll get there, but uh, cyber as, as a specific example is, is a complicated one. How about the difficulty with something like cyber where you know, the insurance and reinsurance industry historically has been very successful in pushing to insureds what your risk mitigation standards should be uh, at a particular company, right? So, I mean, if you, if at a very sort of 50,000 foot level, the insurance industry has been responsible for sort of speed limits and people wearing safety belts in cars. The industry's been very successful at that. How difficult is it when we think about something like cyber to determine what are the risk mitigation aspects that you're gonna to have to see clients, potential clients sort of put into place? And are you gonna to have to partner with specialist firms to sort of get that level of expertise as these emerging risks come to the forefront? Yeah, I, uh, I think that's actually what you're seeing some of the emerging facilities for cyber. They're specifically geared around this the, the, the construct you've described. And I'll mention two of them because just, they've been in the press. So I don't think I'm speaking out of school. But both Aegis and Brit, and Lloyd's, you know, pretty often tends to be the, the sort of the center of, 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 of product innovation, particularly on some of the, you know, some of the fringe risks like cyber. But they're developing products that are tied around reputational damage, around credit, um, uh, credit risk management or mitigation around credit risk management. But there's sort of two thresholds of underwriting. There's the, there's the perception of the risk and the associated rate with that. And then, as you noted, um, they've partnered with operational, not IT, but operational technology experts um, who run uh, any potential insurer through a, a fairly arduous gauntlet process of understanding what it is they actually go through in terms of, of, of securing their intellectual technology or their hard assets, whether it be the, you know, the hard drives that, that, that they're working off of or, or how they're managing data or their data recovery process or how they're backing it up. And I'm the IT expert clearly based on this answer. But, um, but that's, that's, that's absolutely mission critical. Um, and I think going back to like, what's going to drive demand on this product, I think you can see what happened with Target, right? I mean, people don't know uh, the actual cost of of I mean, an exposed email address or, or credit concerns. I've heard ranges anywhere from $8 to $300 per individual. That's what it costs once um, hackers access private information. So if you think about that over the quantum of 40 or $50 million, uh, 50 million um, records lost, I mean, these are tremendous numbers we're dealing with from an individual risk perspective. Um, but ultimately, what's going to drive demand isn't that. It's the fact that their CEO lost his job. And so I think as CEOs and CFOs across a variety of industries, particularly on the retail side, say, boy, that's a, that's a risk that actually could cost me personally um, money or my job. I think you're going to find that people are going to be more aggressive about pursuing insurance solutions or any solutions, um, but would, welcomely, uh, would welcome or I think readily welcome having outside um, intellectual support in, in, in uh, establishing best practices around cybersecurity. Yeah, I think a huge part of the value proposition, actually, for the industry, for a new product uh, in cyber is an example, but it could be true for others and is true for others, is, is sort of the specialist expertise around risk mitigation and claims management that the industry can bring. And in this case, in cyber, you'd be partnering with somebody to help you do that. But certainly for the people who are in the cyber market today, that's a big, big piece of the product suite they offer. I think it's a big piece of why people purchase the coverage. I mean, part of it is the, is the limit, but part of it is somebody who helps me understand what risk do I actually have, how can I mitigate those, and more importantly, if, I have an, if an event occurs, what do I do? There's a, you know, a team of specialists who can come in and, and help me understand what are the next steps I need to take to protect my business, to minimize the cost of this, and to minimize the onward risk to my customers. And you know, we live in this amazingly interconnected world, and if you think about sort of what's the biggest change for for business owners in the last 10 years, I mean, my, one of my points would clearly be it's just so much more interdependency um, than you used to have. I think you could have isolated your, your company a bit, and now I think you certainly can't in any real way. So it, the stakes just get higher and higher around, around this issue. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, moving on, maybe a little bit of a, a controversial question, but um, uh, there has been some talk of the relevancy of the insurance and reinsurance industry. When you think of the threats, and obviously 
relevancy can be a little bit of a nebulous term, but when you think of the threats to a reinsurer's relevancy, are you thinking it from it from the perspective of the risk transfer solution that you're providing, or are you thinking about it from the, uh, the traditional reinsurer <laughs> model perspective? I think the business is, you know, fundamentally, whatever your platform is about risk selection. And I think over time, the best risk selectors are going to be rewarded for being the best risk selector in whatever sort of facet of the market you're in. So I guess from my perspective, I think about it as can we as a business offer products that are relevant and, you know, relevant and useful and an effective value proposition to our customers? I don't really think as much about the model that we're offering that in. I think of us as you know, risk assessors on behalf of our owners. And in order to you know, get the broadest opportunity of risk to select from, we need to be offering a, you know, a competitive and differentiated suite of products to people and doing so in a way that encourages them to you know, place the business with us and come back for the next the next opportunity. Yeah. I mean, personally, I, I know it's not my place to provide the perspective, but I, I would agree. But I just think sometimes in the press, the word relevancy comes up and it sort of gets misconstrued in terms of what it actually means. Relevancy is, is 100% agree with Tom. Relevancy is all about do you get uh, an appropriate viewing at the full spectrum of, of opportunities in the marketplace? I mean, we, we look at the market and we tend to think of it Right? There's, there's great business, there's good business, and there's bad business. And depending on where you are in a pricing cycle, the size of those pie slices are different. And, and um, you know, we talk to our partners, uh, and our partners could be our customers, our brokers, it could be our, our, uh, um, our partners on the rating agency side. And this is where we, we strongly profess you know, the, the role that Validus has in a marketplace. Our value proposition, we're very, very serious about our investments in analytics. We've got 40 people that do nothing but um, uh, do advanced scientific research, that's statistical work, that's meteorological work, um, seismology, um, and all these products. And then we, we also look at the strengths and weaknesses of the vendor models. We've got cab modelers on staff that are um, arguably the best in their profession. And we take all this product because we're trying to make better uh, capital allocation decisions with our, um, with our risk, right? Uh, but also what we do is we push all that product out to our customers, right? We're giving them access to the, the, to the most advanced science because we're trying to create some unique differentiator because we do exist, broadly speaking, in the insurance industry, the reinsurance industry, it's a commoditized market. You've got to create some differentiation the reason being is you want to get access to the good and the great slices. And if you don't have that, then you are irrelevant. And, I, and I, that could be insurance, reinsurance, or any other industry. You've got to find some unique value proposition. For us, it's leveraging our research. I, w I, w I would say relevance uh, is, is definitely key. And you, you don't want to roll out uh, to become more relevant. That might, that might mean you need to merge or acquire, uh, not just doing things on the analytical side and inside the company, but look outside the company as well. Maybe, maybe you're not at a scale, or you don't have a product offering, but somebody else in the market does. I wouldn't rule out some M&A activity. Uh, but also, um, to remain relevant, I think you need to accept um, the uh, convergence of uh, the capital markets, uh, insurance, and reinsurers. You see a lot of reinsurers now looking, they're looking on the insurance side. Perhaps that's where it's best to best to deploy my capital and um, meet the needs both of my shareholders and, and my clients. And then you see the opposite. We have, there's, there's many insurance companies that, have, that are looking into the reinsurance space. Uh, so I think becoming relevant uh, doesn't mean you need to be relevant in your sector. You can think, think beyond that and, um, and accept the, the convergence of the, of the various sectors. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything that's been said. I think that um, taking those two points in, in combination you need to be relevant at what you choose to be relevant in. You don't have to be relevant in everything. Um, you, you, better, you better make sure if you're competing in a relatively commoditized product that you, you, make, you, you differentiate yourself in some way, shape, or form. Otherwise, uh, you will get marginalized. Um, you know, I think as I look across the different um, parts of the market, I think relevancy in some ways, to my earlier point, it's a bit different with Fortune 500 company and what's relevant for uh, Fortune 500 CFO. 
versus uh, a middle market CFO. Um, I think insurance is, is extremely relevant. Um, it's becoming more and more so in emerging markets uh, every day um, and, and, and will continue to be. Um, we've spoken a lot uh, throughout today, throughout the conference, on sort of changes in the marketplace. Um, the reinsurance industry has always had an importance or value attached to relationships. Um, with a number of large players involved in the distribution of risk from insurers through insurance companies uh, into uh, reinsurance companies, how are the broader changes in the market in impacting the, uh, the importance of those relationships and the importance of distribution? Uh, I'll take it. I mean, I, I don't think relationship or the value of relationship has changed from where it was historically other than the fact that you need scale, you need size, you need some unique value proposition, <clears throat> however that's defined. And then, and then you have to have relationships with your partners. And you can define partners as narrowly, as broadly as you'd like, but it's critically important. We, it's still a very small industry. As I noted earlier, the top 30 client groups, um, and this is probably the case across, um, across all product types, but they're, they're account, they account for about 80% of both top line and bottom line on an expected basis. So. It's not a huge percentage or a huge number of people that you're dealing with, and so you've got to have, um, you know, you've got to have well-established and, and, and important relationships with, with each, of, each of these customer groups. So, I think it, it's important today. It will be important tomorrow. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, you can't really argue with that. Um, I think that. Yeah, I guess the question is, are switching costs higher or lower today for customers? I, I think they're probably, if anything, slightly lower than in the past, um, just in terms of the, the friction of being able to switch and, and the implications of it. So it probably puts a higher premium, if anything, on, call it relationship. But relationship is about delivering something of, of value. You know, it's not, um, you know, I mean, part of it is personal, part of it's social, don't, don't get me wrong. But relationships are built on consistently delivering something of value to the other party in the relationship. And I think, you know, the, the need for us to focus on that, the need for every company to focus on that in this industry is that, that drum beat's only getting faster. We need to keep, keep the pressure on trying to maintain, you know, what we were calling relevance, what we're calling relationship. It's all, how are we delivering value in this process to our customers? Something that's perceived as value. And how are we getting the best risk selection opportunities out of that as a result? From that perspective, a, a, a few of the panel have spoken about the, uh, broadly the product being a commoditized product. How difficult it is it then, if you're thinking about a commoditized product, to say that you're going to deliver value on top of that? Now, obviously, not all uh, sort of uh, reinsurance is offered is, is a commoditized product. That may be an unfair sort of generalization or grossly unfair generalization. But if it's perceived as a commoditized product, how, how easy is it to add value to that? When they're evidently, you know, with a commoditized product, there is a bare minimum expectation of what you're going to receive. So I would think about it two different ways. One would be to the relationship point. Um, you know, all we sell is a promise to pay, right? And 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 it takes a fair amount of trust. And I think that that it's not always clear when that trigger has been met. And I think when you have been doing it for 20 plus years, you start to build up a, a, a track record and a certain amount of trust in, in buyers. There is value to that because um, they know when there is a claim that uh, that is fair, then the, the, the check will be cut quickly. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think that, um, anyways, I think that, that, that it, goes, it goes so far. There's a price consideration there. Um, and, you know, every, every reinsurer on the planet swears that they have the best client broker relationships of anybody. And we all spent a lot of time building those, um, and they are very, very important. Um, but, you know, it, it, it goes so far. I, I agree. It, it comes down to, at the end of, end of the day, uh, the price and the willingness to pay. Uh, and yes, you'll, you'll get, uh, because of relationships, you'll have more clients, bigger, bigger shares. That's all very important. But at the end of the day, they're, they, a lot of clients are still fine with having 50 reinsurers on their panel because they know that they're going to get their claim paid at the end of the day. Um, so 
you know, perhaps uh, we've been focusing on, on the, the reinsurance side of things. There is that distribution channel, the, 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 broker, the broker side of things, that uh, I, I, there's need for innovation there as well. There's, that food chain has a lot of costs associated with it, uh, and perhaps we should shift some focus onto that. Is, is that an area that people are currently focusing on quite heavily? Evidently, there have been some examples of, of insurers going effectively, uh, you know, uh, going directly to the alternate capital markets, also really creating some level of broker disintermediation and disruption. Is that something that you're going to expect to continue? Evidently, there's a lot of frictional cost from insured to insurance <coughs> company to reinsurance company. I presume a lot of people are thinking about how am I going to offlay my risk straight to the, the ultimate capital in terms of where it's going to reside. Do I need all of these points along the way where we're going to be paying that frictional cost? I think there's been, you know, it's been around the fringes. I mean, the, if you look at the reinsurance market, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of leverage in the top reinsurance brokers. So it's, um, I, it's probably a relatively challenging area right now where you could make um, truly substantial changes in distribution costs and you know I'd argue our broker partners bring a tremendous amount of value in terms of uh, of advice to customers on capital allocation and product constructs um, and I think a lot of what in a lot of ways that's that's what's created the commoditized environment on the reinsurance side because that role isn't always as prevalently or as, as um, offered by the reinsurance community in, in, in such an upfront fashion, which is why we've invested a lot in analytics, because it creates an environment for us to actually share knowledge insight rather than just pricing capacity. Uh, I think where we'll probably see it more often is where um, alternative capital intersects with either insurance or reinsurance, where that tends to be done um, uh, more often than not on a direct basis, or the relationship between retail and wholesale. We're seeing pockets of capital or capacity move from uh, traditional wholesale environments uh, to direct to consumer or trying to access business more directly. And so I think there's probably more substantial changes that are occurring there. But any, any ability to recognize cost savings in a distribution system is relatively positive for the reinsurance market. Yeah, I would say that people are doing it in different ways. I think a lot of Bermuda reinsurers in, in general are looking to move closer to the original risk, uh, and that might be via uh, acquiring an onshore platform, uh, investing in developing their own onshore platform. Uh, but you're, you're certainly seeing that right now. And then having a reinsurance company and then having relationships through the ILS space, and so you're able to link the three together rather than having to sort of piece them together. I think that's probably the the trend, but it's difficult to observe because it all occurs behind closed doors. Well, at this point, so thank you very much for those perspectives. At this point, maybe I could uh, open it up to the audience if there are any questions for our panel at this point in time. I know we're getting towards the end of the day, so I'm guessing that there'll probably be less questions than earlier. A question? question on terror, and, and I'm not sure if I heard you correctly, did you say that there, you thought there should be an industry, or, or could be an industry solution for terror, and then what's the future of TRIA and some of the other pools in, uh, in Europe or UK? Yeah, I, I think there, I think there will be, and well, I th first I think there should be, and then I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm confident that there will be, now I don't know if this is in the short term or intermediate term, but I'm really speaking specifically from a conventional perspective. NBCR is, um, I, I guess one could argue you could calculate frequency, uh, but you can never convince me that, that the industry has um, the capability or the balance sheet to manage severity associated with a nuclear chemi chemical uh, or biological attack in an urban area. So that's a government that's clearly an area where the government should play a, um, a role. I think from a conventional perspective, um, we look at what's sold in the London market, we look at what's sold in the direct market, and from our perspective, we would want to see business insurers, and there's a headline out today, but we want to see them weaned off of the government subsidization provided by TRIA. I don't know what's going to happen. We try to stay up to speed on it, but I think with the House um, change. There's been a Senate bill that's passed. We would argue that it's 
um, um, it's probably the wrong direction. It's too long. There's not enough uh, expansion of the private market role. On the House side, um, they haven't been able to find a middle ground, but I think with the, uh, with the turnover of the House control, we're likely to see a short-term extension, um, and you know, that could be six to nine months, and then maybe they'll revisit it once you know, the power base is a little bit more firmly entrenched. Um, so that's our hope. You know, outside of that, we could spend a lot of time talking about each and every country, which I'm happy to do, Cliff. But um, so I'll just stop there. Well, I'll, I'll comment that it, it's hard to compete with free. So the uh, as far as in the U.S., <laughs> but it, if you look in Europe, Australia, it, it's a much better balance. There's there's a cost for the product. They buy reinsurance, um, and and I know the the various pools do get together and share best practices. Um, and I would just. In, and encourage that that continues, and I think it's a waiting game to some extent uh, to see TRIA reduce, uh, or the U.S. Reli reduce its reliance on TRIA. Any other questions? Okay, so maybe just, maybe just one final question from me, which um, I obviously depend on uh, sort of your own personal perspectives, but throughout today we've heard a lot of um, attributes of reinsurance companies that are potential differentiators for those companies. We've, we've heard about sort of human capital and technology and data analytics. But from your perspective, what are the most important differentiating factors uh, for a traditional reinsurer today in today's marketplace? I, I think size out of the gate is critically important. We can't be underestimated how um, important, even just the optics of a big balance sheet are to reinsurance buyers. Um, so I think that's that's incredibly important. Um, you know, I think a broad product offering is important, um, but it um, but beyond that, uh, one's ability to provide. It, it, it's hard to pigeonhole it for us. I mean, we really strongly feel that it's the size of the balance sheet with the capacity with this data analytics, whether it's big data or unique scientific research, you've got to find some role that isn't currently um, occupied by, by someone else or by too many other people. And, and from our perspective, one's ability to leverage cutting edge science and analytics is not um, uh, a highly occupied area. The brokers play a certain role in that respect, but they lack access to data from the full spectrum of the industry. We can aggregate that information and share um, benchmarks, um, short market share information with our customers. And we find that that is um, eagerly consumed by our customer base. So it's finding some, some unique value proposition for us. And then lastly, I think um, understanding and being able to capitalize on capital inflows. That's whether you've got a relationship with an ILS provider or, or ILS capacity in-house, and this is really sort of myopic view on the, on the cap market, but I think having that capability, because we're just not quite sure where the market's going to break. I don't know if we're in a cyclical or a structural change or some combination thereof, but having that ability to be able to toggle one way or the other, broadly speaking, in the industry, I think is really critically important. I mean, I'll take a slightly different <coughs> angle on it, which would be to say, I think, you know, risk culture is incredibly important in an environment like, environment like this and decision making. I think in our business, it is easy if you don't have the right corporate culture, if you don't have the right risk discipline, to fool yourself about the price of your product, to fool yourself about the margins. We don't have a, a perfect way to know the cost of goods sold. There's still a lot of interpretation, even though we have advanced analytics. There's still a lot of qualitative judgment that goes into the pricing process. And I think making sure you've got a culture within the organization that encourages, you know, honesty around that process uh, is is really important to long-term success, particularly in a, in a challenging market where you're going to have to make very difficult decisions about what risks are acceptable and what risks aren't acceptable. Uh, coming from, a, I guess, compared to this panel, from a, a rather smaller reinsurer, I'll call myself niche for the moment. Um, I would say that it's not it's not all about size. Uh, I'm sure everyone will, will agree, um, but it's, uh, it's it's let's get back to, to quality and, and relevance. Um, and for someone like Hamilton Re, where we're trying to actively manage both sides of the balance sheet, the asset mat, the asset side and the underwriting side, um, and that that's some it's a differenti differentiating factor that we have. Uh, and then 
get back to embracing technology. Uh, all our clients are, are using predictive modeling and data analytics to um, price the original business come in. Well, let's keep on, on pace with that and uh, do the same on the reinsurance side. You know, from my perspective, I would say that you know, I think that you need to have a certain size balance sheet uh, as that's sort of a sort of an entry cost. Um, you know, I think that the breadth of product offering and 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 being local enough to to serve your client needs is is important. So a geographic footprint that meets the areas that you want to do business in, I think, is is very important. Um, but I also, you know, I like I like Tom's um, comment about you know the underwriting culture that that. Particularly at this stage in the market right now, where it's been nine years since there've been any major landfalling hurricanes in the U.S., uh, it's been this. If nothing happens this year, uh, a full two years without any hurricanes hitting the U.S. and and that that we run the risk of complacency, and people can start kidding themselves as to what the cost of goods sold is. It's it's their models, and people have their own views of cost of goods sold. But now is the stage in the market where people need to be very. Um, Cognizant of of the uh, of the willingness to, to fudge a little bit um, and be uh, be be have a culture that enables tough underwriting decisions to be made. Thanks very much. I had a lot to take the opportunity to thank each of you for the, uh, the valuable insights that you provided uh, the time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott.